Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for tuning in. Uh, today, I am talking to Dr. Escolona. Uh, he is from Manila. He is a functional uh, MD with a master's in nutrition. And we're talking about how the, the health benefits and how we can help out the jiu-jitsu community. So tell us a little bit about your background, Doc. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Uh, is it Hi Hi Iro, Hi Iro, right? Iro, Iro, yeah. Iro, okay. Thanks Iro. for inviting me, Iro, and hello to everyone listening to Iro's work. Um, you're doing good work. I, I reviewed a lot of your content previously. Thank you for the work um, and for being invited here. So um, I'm an MD, uh, as what Iro was uh, mentioning. And I had my training in San Diego, um, took a master's in nutrition at Bastyr University, and then I proceeded to take a functional medicine certification from the Institute for Functional Medicine, which took about another two years. I was fortunate to be one of the first Filipino physicians to be mentored by functional medicine faculty. Um, my mentor was Dr. Lisa Portera Perry. She's working down in San Diego, and we were working with a lot of autoimmune patients um, for about two years. Since that time, though, uh, my practice has shifted um, because of personal reasons and other types of reasons from a solely autoimmune, reversing autoimmune disease type of practice to more of the neurologic, neuromuscular types of conditions. And I think that was why I started to get into this type of research, looking into the evidence basis for improving physiologic function um, of athletes from a molecular standpoint. Uh, considering, um, and later on, we'll dive into that, um, understanding the work of the mitochondria, if you're familiar with that term, oh, yeah. the powerhouse of each cell, yep. and how that is actually integral in every cr chronic disease or any, any disease or um, health spectrum that you're trying to move in and improve. Yeah, that's where energy gets processed, yeah. Yep, yep. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to fire away, Iro. if you have any top questions. Well, well first thing is, uh, what, what is, because functional medicine is like still somewhat like relatively new. So for mm -hmm. people who don't know, what, what exactly is functional medicine? All right. So, so functional medicine is not a subspecialty. It's a model of care where we're trying to understand and treat the root cause of chronic disease. So for any condition out there, whether it's a headache, whether it's pain, whether it's um, chronic inflammation, uh, a conventional physician, when I, when I was trained previously, the question for us would be, what's the diagnosis? Clench the diagnosis because each diagnosis is matched with a specific therapy, whether it's a drug, a procedure, or any other therapy. Um, for functional medicine, what we're trying to understand is this idea that every symptom or disease has a root cause. And these root causes come from a gene environment interaction. And so when we're born, we used to think before that our genes would, would be 100% of the reasons why we get chronic disease. But now we're understanding that genetics plays about 20%, more or less, that's what the scientists are, are finding out, and that the environment called the epigenome, the things that affect your genes, contribute the other 80%. And so the 80% then would, would compose of internal, external environments coming from basic lifestyle stuff, nutrition, sleep, stress. Um, you're looking at toxic exposure, looking at chronic infections that are not treated. You're looking at sleep, sleep um, regularity and quality of sleep. Uh, it extends all the way into, into the sociogenomic aspect of how patients actually have relationships that support them through life. So that creates seven different um, key points of intervention. So I'm going to repeat them. It's nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress management, relationships, and networks. Then the other two are more medical. It's more, they, they involve toxic exposure and chronic untreated infections. Okay. Um, so those are the seven that we kind of start to unravel and understand for each patient. And okay. so functional medicine then, as we work on those seven, has the ability to change genetic expression to reverse certain chronic conditions. It doesn't happen for everyone, but we do have um, conditions that are truly rever reversible through this process. Okay. And that's where the epigenetics comes in, because epigenetics is yeah. gene expression, right? And exactly. Epigenetics, yeah. 
Yeah, and I know that um, I've heard uh, before where, where they talk about the meditative state that you can actually turn on certain genes just by basically the stress level, learning how to yeah. like, manage your own stress. And that's where mm -hmm. the nutrition comes in. And that's also where I feel like where they talk about the, the GI tract and how the, the uh, you have a set number of like something like 20 some odd thousand like genes, but then like the bacteria in your, in your, uh, your GI tract has like, like millions. And that actually yep. affects and how you, how, what kind of genes. So that's where the nutrition is like an important factor to uh, actual gene expression. So it's not just, it's not just how you eat, but it's what you eat because, and then there's the, the bacteria in your stomach reacts to what you eat. Is that, my, is that what I'm understanding? That's actually exactly where science is at now. So if I could just uh, segment what you were saying. Okay. Um, what we used to think was that everything in our bodies were dictated by the genes in our cells. So if I have my brain cell, it has its set of genes and it creates function from the sets of genes. Um, however, scientists have expanded that concept. What they've understood now and found out was that there's about 100 trillion bacteria, what you're mentioning, the microbiome that's living in our intestinal tract. And so if you eat food, if you um, are subjected to stress, if you get exposed to a toxin, they first go through the microbiome. And that microbiome processes all those signals and sends signals into the body. So if you think about it, it's like sifting through and you have different filters. Gotcha. First filter is your microbiome, then they create signals, and then the second filter is your own genetic um, processes, and then that gets turned on and off by the signals from the microbes. And so now we're seeing, with the way that the world is um, set up with all the antibacterial agents, with the way we're eating, it changes the microbiome diversity. Meaning, if I were living in the US, instead of having 20 different cultures, you have your Asian, Hispanic, European. You have one or two dominant ones that come on top. And that's no good for any type of situation. And so when that happens to a microbiome, when there are a couple of dominant signatures, then they take hold of all the signals that are being created. The other microbes can't balance out those signals. And so if I were, for example, hit by, let's talk about COVID. If you're hit by the COVID infection or if you're hit by some other viral infection, bacterial infection, and you don't have the balance of the other bacteria or viruses, they can't protect you against this one agent. There's too many of them. And that's where disease starts to come in. And we, don't, we haven't identified what microbe signal creates what diseases, but what we're seeing is that a bunch of different signals will start to turn on certain genes that create inflammation. And that's, that's well-researched. The, the signal in the gene is called the NFKB. It's pretty scientific. It's NFKB, NFKB. -B. But that's just a, a scientific term for the master regulator of inflammation. And, and once you turn on this NFKB, -B, inflammation starts to roll. Yeah, now, now we're and running so into that, that inflammation. Once inflammation goes in, you have all kinds of issues. Uh, exactly, it's exactly. Correlated inflammation to everything. I mean, it, uh, aging, cancer, uh, joint issues, arthritis. Yeah. Uh, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> so, so, so now this, this master regulator, the NF-CAPB, is where most of the scientific research has come into. What are all the interventions across the seven that we had mentioned that will either turn up or turn down this nf kappa signaling? And that's where nutrition comes in. That's where exercise comes in because there are a lot of research and meditation where nf kappa is actually turned down when you do meditation. Um, nf kappa is turned down when you take more antioxidants, curcumin, all these other uh, wonderful things. And then the key then would be how much signals am I putting into my body to turn up nf -kappa -B? And how much signals am I putting into my body to turn down nf -kappa -B? And now you have a very specific way of understanding how your body will react to the environment. And if you take it from a patient to patient perspective, so I see a lot of patients, you'll see that their threshold for activation of nf -kappa -B is very different from one patient to the next. So the sensitivity is way different. And tying this way back into the jujitsu perspective, into the jujitsu practice and, um, and uh, martial arts form, 
when I started to, when I got invited to that lecture that I did last November for the Cobrin event in Manila, um, mm. what they asked me was that to understand, all right, we really don't know what happens to the body before, during, and after an event or after workout. What is happening physiologically? So I started to look into the articles. That's what I had sent you. Mm. And what we're seeing is that um, in any match, there really is about uh, five minutes of, in, if you're an amateur, there's five minutes of intense combat or exertion time. And jiu-jitsu in particular has two types of force that's being created. One is the um, consistent force that you have to have grip strength persistently throughout more than 30 seconds. And the other is um, compared to shoving force where you have to get people off you for a brief number of seconds. And yeah, what we're so, seeing... I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. And what we're seeing in the literature is that um, in these short spans of five-minute workouts or intense workouts in competition, the body starts to, number one, use a lot of carbohydrates because it needs to generate a lot of heat and energy. And number two, it starts to create damage. Um, damage in the sense of not just the muscles being damaged, but because the body is creating so much energy, uh, just like a car would create exhaust, the mitochondrial system creates some form of exhaust whenever you produce energy through that system. And so as you increase the time that you're competing in jiu-jitsu, you increase the energy requirement and you increase the internal toxicity from the energy that's being created. Yeah, it's a byproduct of the of, of ATP production went through the mind. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So now the question would be, in that setting, um, what would then be nutritional interventions to mitigate the byproduct? We call the, we call the byproduct ROS, reactive oxygen species, um, but we just call them toxins just for everyone to understand it better. Um, and so what would you then provide pre- match during interim match and post match to be able to recover quickly um, and we can go into that later on but uh, maybe you have some questions that, that are floating in your mind right now that you wanted to ask no 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 I mean, so so far i'm understanding what you're saying i was correlating back to this it's kind of it's it's funny how you like scientifically you're talking about the carbohydrate thing where you know just talking amongst jiu-jitsu practitioners it's it, it's almost your body is re is requesting carbohydrates, like no matter how you try to actually eat, you, you can't avoid. Like you just feel better when you're training if you're training consistently to like up your actual carbohydrates. So uh, I was having a discussion with someone earlier that I was just trying to explain to her that you know that's why like if you look at MMA fighters or like like really high level jujitsu people is their their body fat is not as lean as it possibly could because of the, the style of training that they're doing because it's, it's a high level anaerobic stage that they just need to tap into the, the fat source to maintain it as yep. well as they need an excessive amount of carbohydrates to kind of feed the machine in order for them to do it, you know, consistently. Because when we're training, one thing is the actual like sporting event, the actual competition where, you know, it's like you said, five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever high level there is. But when you're doing training, you're talking, you're putting in uh, five, six minute rounds, eight to 10 rounds on a daily basis. So we're talking f almost an hour every single day of actual, of like high intensity conditioning. Yeah. And you can't, you can't couple that with a, with a trim diet mm -hmm. of like low carbohydrates because you want to try to get lean. It just, you just won't function. Yeah. You can, you can mentally. That, you're going to burn out. Yeah. You're going to burn that's, out. That's exactly. And then, and then, and then it causes other issues. And then all of a sudden <laughs> you're like, uh, I, I, I got hurt doing a takedown. It's like, did you really get hurt? Or was it really that your body was just so fatigued because you're not feeding it the proper yeah. fuel because you're trying to trim down that last little couple pounds that you want to trim down. Um, that's exactly where, um, yeah, that's exactly what I was uh, trying to share. You're, you're really know a lot of about this stuff but maybe just to add to what you had just mentioned um so the mitochondria those powerhouses of the cells are most abundant in three organs in the body um the first organ is the brain the second is the liver and the third is the muscle system uh, and what we know of the mitochondria is that they undergo this function of fusion and fission fusion and fission right um 
we can't grow new mitochondria, but we can fuse them together to produce more energy. If they, if they have a, what we call mitochondrial fission, where they have to split and they have less heads in one mitochondria, they'll produce less energy. Apart from fusion, fusion and fission, um, the ways to induce fusion and fission are very set. And there are actually a lot of neurologists learning to do this for the brain for post-stroke patients. We do it for our patients here. Um, and what we know is similar to what you guys do on a daily basis. When you trigger the nerve to turn on, when you trigger it to create energy, um, that will trigger fusion, mitochondrial fusion, to create more energy. And that strengthens the energy capacity. If, however, your system has a couple of things that will stop energy production, fission will happen because they have to produce less energy from that perspective. Um, and so the, the set points uh, for fusion and fission are, first of all, does the person have stable oxygenation throughout? If you have uh, fluctuations in, in oxygenation, then you'll have fluctuations fluctuations in the energy production potential. So okay. the first Here, things that we look into for... So, so wait, hold on, before you, before you go on that, because that's, that's a good point. So if you, if, so then how, what, what dictates that fluctuation of oxidation? Yeah, so the, the first thing that we check actually is a complete blood count and the sizes of the red blood cells. Looking into very basic iron panels. <clears throat> um, I've seen a couple of patients, a number of patients, um, having normal red blood cell counts. But when we run the iron panel, looking into ferritin, serum ferritin, uh, serum iron ferritin, and total iron binding, every marker is deficient. Simply because iron is pretty weirdly uh, distributed in the body. When you have less than 20% of iron in the body, that's the only time your red blood cells will come down in number. And most doctors miss this out. And so what we look at actually in the red blood cell um, testing are the sizes. You'll see there a marker called um, mean cell volume, mean cell um, hemoglobin concentration. These will dictate the size of the cell and the, the amount of hemoglobin it's allowed to carry. Low iron will lead to smaller cells. And so smaller cells, lower oxygen carrying capacity, meaning no matter how much you're gonna push, that's just a nutrient deficiency that's not going to get you over. The so the, 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 logic, the logical question is there, it would be to then ask is, then what about women? Because doesn't, that, doesn't, doesn't the average woman, because of their menstrual cycle, usually have like a lower iron count in their blood? Yep, 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 it does. It, they do. Um, and so what the, there are a couple of ways to pick up low iron in the body. Uh, the most sensitive physical exam are pale eye, uh, conjunctiva or underneath the eye beds. The, the next would be if, if you're familiar with people who've smoked most of their lives, you'll see that the edges of their nails are clubbed or curved. Yeah, and I, so that's I, I, a I, setting, you see people like, <laughs> that's <laughs> a setting of consistently low oxygenate, oxygen in the tips of the fingernails. Another sign would be if you press on the nail bed, it's tip, it should typically be colored pink, but if you press on it, it's gonna turn white. If, you, if it's already white and you press on it, it just maintains that white color, then that's low oxygen. That's a sign or a physical exam that may point towards some form of iron deficiency or low oxygen carrying capacity for the patient. Um, different people have different types of oxygenation issues, but that's one basic one that we're trying to uh, mitigate. The other one is stable blood sugar. <clears throat> the so, moment the person's wait, blood wait, sugar before, before you go on to the next, good. before you go on to the next point, so then, sure. so then the the normal deduction would be then 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 part of the diet for 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 people that are jujitsu competitors is to make sure that you're that you have a diet that's high in iron. Uh, or some form of iron, which is a weekly basis, some form. So the, the best form would be liver, uh, if you're familiar with organ meats and livers. Okay. Uh, that is actually a very good source, um, okay. which we, we do provide for patients, and we see that it, it, it helps out. However, if a patient does have um, an iron deficiency, uh, it's nice to know the level, so you can test it if you have access to it, and then correct it, and it 
typically stays on that level after you correct it. I got you. Okay. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I interrupted. So you're talking about... No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. You, yeah. you can cut cut the <laughs> call anyway. So the next one is really the the understanding that blood sugar also fluctuates the energy. So if I eat a sugary, I don't know, sugary meal, it's going to jump up, pick up my blood sugar. My insulin will kick in and it's going to store the blood sugar and it's going to drop my blood sugar after 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's always nice to mix carbohydrate rich foods with fiber or protein sources because mm -hmm. after glucose, it's protein that's, that the body's going to use up next, and then it's going to shift to the fatty source of energy after protein. <clears throat> um, any, any questions with that? Does yeah, that make sense? It's very basic the, stuff, the, I think. That. So the, the sugar thing, I've, I've read a couple things about that insulin reaction is like the major component of why the majority of us gain weight, especially now with mm -hmm. society the way it is. Um, mm -hmm. For for the jujitsu person, the average jujitsu person is actually pretty healthy, relatively, mm -hmm. because you can't really, <laughs> you can't eat poor and maintain your energy levels while you're training, um, unless you talk to like a lot of the like if I've I've been with a lot of like the high level jujitsu guys and their their foundational diet is pretty well rounded, but then I'm assuming and I again I don't know it, it could be a combination of them being young them being here in the United States, and then also in combination with them training, but about probably about 40 to 50, 40% 40 of their diet is an excessive amount of calories. Like where they're eating just like, just, I wouldn't say like poor food, but very rich food and like in, in large quantities. And then, you know, you see them in the, in the, in the gym and they're relatively, relatively lean. And it's, it's, in, I feel like it's in combination that, that they're eating their body's obviously requesting the amount of calories that they're consuming. And then they're yeah. just, they have their foundational like core diet, whatever that is. And then the outside is like, ah, whatever. I just finished training like two, three hours. I can, I can kind of yeah. splurge and have like a slice of pizza and, you know, and a hamburger and some fries because I just need the calories. So yeah. for me, the question is, is that how do, because that's also not good for you in the long run. I think mm -hmm. that's good for you now. It feels good. It helps you recover. I think it gives you the energy for you to keep training. But that's because when you're when you're 20, your body is able to process all that that the poor food. Yeah, consuming. But <laughs> you're right on the money, negative right? effects to it down the road. You know what I mean? There's got to be something. Yeah, there's got to be some effect mm -hmm. of it, like in 10 years from today, where you're not going to be able. It's it's going to put a lot of stress on your body to process all that poor food that you're having. So then it comes down to the question is like, how does someone who is at that high level training or is training quite a bit, like find that gap of calories where it's like, okay, I, I, my body's obviously requesting extra fuel. What, what can I do in order for me to be able to up my calories and not have to consume like poor, poor food? Does that make sense? Like not yeah. poor, like, <laughs> yeah. economic poor, like poor, like, like not healthy food. So this is a really good topic. Um, there are a couple of things I wanted to comment about what you had just said. So the, the first is before I answer the uh, quality question, right? So, so what's the, the food quality type of question? The thing that I wanted to share is that there's this concept that was created a couple of years back called organ reserve. And what you were mentioning where, where people are eating, they're, they're, they're very, ac very active, but they don't eat as well and that they don't recover as well in the next 10 years um, place into that concept of organ reserve. And organ reserve is this idea that when we were born, um, there's a maximum capacity of healthy cells that our, that our body has, right? So let's say the liver has an organ reserve of 100. The moment you, you get drunk the first time, uh, maybe in high school uh, or maybe grade seven or, or, or what, whatever grade whatever. you got drunk the first time, <laughs> right, down alcohol, um, you, you might have reduced your organ reserve by a couple of points. But in your earlier years, you'd wake up with no hangover and you could do it for three days straight, right? If you recall those, those times in our lives where yeah. you could get drunk and, and kind of recover. The, the longer your recovery time, the longer, uh, the more organ reserve is depleted in the system is what the, is what the scientists are talking about. And so um, 
if you if you're mentioning this this highly trained athlete, he's he's doing his uh, daily training, um, has a core meal plan, and then eats crappy stuff, uh, <laughs> language crappy stuff outside. Then what would happen then in the long run is that for firstly his organ reserve would start to come down because it's true that the cells start to have some wear and tear. Second. Um, those types of foods will t- start to shift his microbiome, which we had talked about previously. And in that shift in the microbiome, typically, if you have more carbohydrate-heavy, more processed food items, you shift toward cultivating more infectious types of bacteria. And so these infectious types of bacteria can generate that nf kappa B that we were mentioning and start to create inflammation in different parts of the body. <clears throat> Um, but it takes years for that to happen because uh, you then have to have other types of, um, I guess, triggers to shift the microbiome. Key triggers are stress, antibiotics, surgical procedures. Um, so that's for that segment. Now, when we talk about functional nutrition, I'll put in the concept of functional nutrition. We're always looking into the idea that food isn't just about calories, that food is about um, genetic messaging. It's about the, the language that your cells need to, to turn on different functions. And so we look into this concept called the PFC MVP, right? So PFC MVP. PFC MVP stands for the macronutrients, so proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Do we have an adequate amount of those three? And then MVP stand for the minerals, vitamins, and the phytochemicals. And so whenever we eat, do we have these six factors in each meal? Um, and that's where actually we're trying to understand that, where we, where we can understand that if we do have those six, we're able to now mitigate um, the damage that's being done uh, on a daily basis from exposure. Does it make sense? Did it, did it make sense? Yeah, did it answer? Food, yeah, okay. Basically, food, food is medicine, is what basically you're saying. In other words, from, yeah. what, you're, from what you just finished explaining, it just sounds like in order for your body to heal properly, because that's basically what life is, is stress, physical stress, mental stress, whatever stress, and that the, the, the food that you eat, if you eat it in the correct amounts, the microbiome then has a genetic uh, expression, and then from there, it, it helps the body actually kind of recover from the actual stress or whatever it may be, uh, the amount, yeah. whether it's physical stress, mental stress, whatever type of stress. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's that's actually where you want to be. <clears throat> the other thing that, that we had that I we had uncovered um, with mitochondrial work, and this is mostly from the work that I had done in autism that I'm doing now for kids with autism. Um, if you think about it, autism is low mitochondrial energy production in the brain, and so when you have these Brazilian jiu-jitsu athletes trying to power up the mitochondria in the muscle system and in the brain, um, it's similar to how we work with kids. The, the thing that we look into the most are nutrients to produce energy in that mitochondria and the nutrients that will shuttle energy into the mitochondria. And so key nutrients would be, I mentioned iron, um, B vitamins, because they're the ones that turn on the ATP machinery. Um, you have magnesium, you have zinc, you have uh, the shuttle for fats called carnitine and the fish oils, the fatty acids. A lot, of, a lot of work being done now on um, the MCT diets, if you're familiar with those, people taking coconut oil, people taking a lot of fats. Uh, what we're seeing now is that for some people, there's a genetic deficit to bring the fats into the cells coming from an issue with carnitine metabolism. So carnitine is actually a shuttle that brings the fat into the mitochondria to be processed. And carnitine is, is abundant in meat products. Carnitine is abundant in a lot of these things, but we still get a lot of these advanced testing called uh, advanced test results from what we call organic acid tests showing a deficit in carnitine. Um, and the reason that the, the experts are thinking of is that a couple, there are about five genes that will carry carnitine in the body. Uh, most of these guys don't have these carnitine genetics. And so you would then need to supplement them with carnitine at the end of the day. Um, and this is just one nutrient, right? This is just carnitine we're talking about. It can happen for any nutrient on the spectrum. And so uh, I guess what I'm trying to share here is that 
the field of nutrition and I guess molecular nutrition, functional nutrition is headed into this, this world where precision is the name of the game, where we're, we're going to understand how your particular body will respond to certain foods and how do we now move you through the goals that you'd like to have for the, for the jujitsu work that you want to do. Okay. Um, so you sent me an article talking about also the heart rate responses. Can you, can you speak mm -hmm. a little bit on that? Because I know that I have a, a friend of mine who, uh, he's basically somewhat, he's not, he's got a master's in exercise science. He's owns a personal training certification, but he's also a professional cyclist as well. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and he was telling me, he was kind of describing like how to approach if you wanted to design like a cardio program for like a jujitsu athlete and it's oh. like, it's not necessarily, it's not about so much about the training zone. It's about how fast you can recover from the training zone. So he was explaining to me that, you know, he goes in grappling and wrestling or, or stuff that's very high anaerobic. He goes, we, we get like that in cyclists when we're going uphill. But what we do is that we we work on the heart recovery rate, so we kind of come up with like cardio programs that design that are designed so that we can be at like eighty or ninety percent of our maximum heart rate for hours. He's like he's like one of the uh, I guess a competition that we had that he was at like he averaged like eighty five percent of his heart, maximum heart rate for something like an hour and like twenty minutes when he was riding, um, and he goes and that's where when you get to the high, the highest level of, of well, again, I'm using cycling, uh, the difference between Lance Armstrong or some of the, like the high level uh, athletes is, is that they go in spurts. So they're able to go up to that 90% red line, their heart rate, hold it for a certain amount of time, eat, pedal back, get the heart rate down as quick as possible for them to then push it up again. Um, and so he was kind of telling me that like, you know, he's like, you should, you need, you should, you wear a heart rate monitor, like figure out what, what your average heart rate is while you train and then come up with like a program in order for you to do it. Now that's him being a cyclist. I yeah. also talked to an athletic trainer who was a black belt in jujitsu a few days ago. And he told me that there's no real, not, I wouldn't say not a need, but, uh, if, if, you, if you're doing like hard training while you're actually doing jujitsu, where you feel like, let's say you're on a scale of one to 20 and you're getting close to that 20 almost with every roll, then there's no reason for you to do additional cardio work. But if you're not, then go ahead and complement it or supplement your actual jujitsu training so that you can add in the, the, the additional cardiovascular work because that really when you get to that high level or when you're doing that, those competitions, when you're trying to get first place, that extra two seconds or five seconds makes a huge difference. That's it. Yeah. yeah. That's the, that's the winning, winning two seconds or five seconds. <clears throat> so um, I think what that, is your opinion on that? Like, is this something that like, how, how would you approach it if you need to approach it and what happens to actually, because yeah. I saw this a little, like I briefly read one of the articles that you read and it kind of went over like what, how the body reacts in that type of environment of jujitsu. Yeah. So um, I guess the, the way to answer your question, and I, I wouldn't know if, if what I'm going to tell you would really be uh, the most accurate thing, because I don't practice the jujitsu. I'm just going to trace kind of the molecular, molecular kind of science behind it. Okay. Um, but right now, the, the consensus is amongst us functional medicine practitioners, when we're kind of helping these, these high-level athletes is, to track data. Uh, the more data points we have for one patient, the better you can now shift moment, moment to moment all the factors to improve their performance. And so you were, your, your friend was talking about improving performance through physical activity, like changing the routines and improving that. So if you track the data for the athlete, you would actually have um, enough data to understand, okay, can we push more? Is he actually hitting 90% of heart rate capacity mm -hmm. uh, or is it 85%? And at that level, um, at, you, at the level that you're talking about, the difference between an 82% 
maximal capacity versus 84, 85% max, maximal capacity is actually profound in the recovery phase. And so when I was actually training in San Diego, we were doing a lot of work. Uh, we did a lot of training for um, the zones that you were talking about, the understanding the, the zone for training. And the zones are very, very specific to the, to the number or to the percentile of heart rate variability or the heart rate change. So if you're working on zone two, for example, you can't go above a certain uh, beats per minute or exercise capacity because you won't be able to have enough recovery to do the next zone for the next day. And, and that would then create the training blocks for the next couple of months. Um, I haven't done that. Explain that a little bit because I've actually heard that before. You're talking about HRV, heart rate variability. Yeah. And they're talking about where that's uh, that kind of couples a little bit with what my friend was telling me when he's, a, uh, again, it goes back to him being a cyclist. He actually, he has like the, the um, he has an altitude bed. He actually has, okay. um, oh. yeah, <laughs> a rate like, like, a, like, like you see like at a hospital where that he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Heart rate in, the, in the morning. And that dictates exactly for him how he's going to train for the day. And it dictates yeah. what it's going to do for the actual week. And then he doesn't adjust the altitude bed until, until his resting heart rate um, goes back down to the number. In other words, when he sleeps in the, the altitude bed, his heart rate is elevated while he actually sleeps because obviously his breathing is labored because there's not enough oxygen in the air. But then he, at a certain point, the body then adapts and then his, heart, his resting heart rate is now back to normal then he raises the altitude again and, and again it's just basically oxygen depriving the body so that, yeah. that when he does actually go out on the road he's able then to push harder while he's actually doing it um yeah so like I said, he's like he he basically he's a scientist on himself yeah uh, but <laughs> which is cool yeah which is which is excellent <laughs> uh but but what i'm what i want to know is like ex explain to me like the hrv part because i've heard it a couple times yeah. from a couple different people but I really don't 100% understand what that, what that concept is yet. Okay, so, so let's, let's separate the two things. Um, the heart rate I was mentioning in the zones is the heart rate for maximal exertion. So there's zone one, two, three, four, and you have percentage to which you can exert during the exercise um, event. Heart rate variability is the moment-to-moment uh, -moment change in heart rate uh, response, meaning... If I'm walking right now, unless I'm sitting right now, and I stand up, what would be the rate of change of my heart from sitting to standing? That's heart rate variability. And typically, there are a lot of bands that you could use to pick up heart rate variability. But mostly, it's effective in understanding um, how well your heart can adapt to moment-to-moment -to -moment changes in the environment. Uh, environment can be different things from exercise to non-exercise. And so what we know is that as you increase heart rate variability, so, so the moment-to-moment the -moment change of your heart, there's a lot of change, meaning your heart can adapt to different things very quickly. Higher heart rate variabilities allow for better resting potentials in the body or better rest for the body during sleep and recovery. Uh, heart rate variability is typically increased through activities of meditation, breath work, um, rest and relaxation types of things, and so our imagery. And the, the institute that's actually working on this is the Institute uh, for Heart Math, if you're familiar with that concept. Um, Heart Math is in Northern California in Santa Rosa. And very interesting work that these guys are doing. Uh, they're looking into the heart rate variability of a person and the magnetic field that it creates around them to induce change to other heart That's rate cool. variabilities. It, it's pretty amazing stuff. So what they were looking into and what they tested, one of the papers was this, this owner of a pet who really loved the pet. And they, they saw that as the pet would be nearer to the owner, the heart rate variability would improve. Similar to um, the second experiment was a husband and wife. and what they asked the husband and wife to do was to say mean things to each other. And as they said mean things, their heart rate variabilities um, went off sync. 
as they started to create appreciation for each other and to give words of affirmation, their heart rate variability starts to sync together. That's uh, amazing. That's cool. it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, you can check out the work from, from the Heart Math Institute, uh, Santa Rosa. But so, so now we're seeing that um, heart rate variability is one good measure for recovery whenever you're trying to do certain things or, or how much stress you're under, how much recovery you have. And then the, for the exercise part, it's really the zones to create that improvement in one or two percentile scores for the oxygenation of the body. Um, I hope that makes sense. I, I just went no, no, one hundred percent that makes sense. Yeah, they, they, and I, I, I totally understand it. Like the the way I was, the way I remember learning was that's this is a new term that I've just again, it's a heart rate variability. I've always always taught it was the heart recovery rate, and that was what was important. In other words, if if you're at eighty percent and one week, and you're back down to forty percent in one minute, and then next week you're at eighty percent and you're down to forty percent in 50 seconds, you're doing good. Basically, yeah. your, your heart is able to actually kind of recover faster. But what you're saying is that it's not only just that recovery, but now they're actually coming out with ways of, it's the, the variance of up and down, yeah. and the, the better it's able to go up and down, the, the, the more, the easier it is for your body to recover from the, the stress yeah. of life, whatever that activity may be. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things exactly. that, I, that, I, that, that I listened to, and the guy was saying that not, one of the guys that, that was explaining the, the HRV, it was like a, like a short seminar. And he was saying that to not track it like 24-7, that, that, that it's too much information, that you want to kind of pace out how you do it so that you want to do it like once a day or early in the morning before your body actually starts moving so that it's at a resting position, kind of like what you used to, at least when, when 20 years ago when I started the fitness industry, was just you know basic resting heart rate. Like, like what do I do? Take my resting heart rate? Yeah. Do I do the activity? Do I do yeah, the activity? You're bad. <laughs> you know, you do the activity or not, you know what I mean? Um, so it's kind of like, it seems like it's, a, like it's the same principle, a lot, but just more expansive now. It's more detailed, like, okay, well, that yeah, HRV yeah. over a week is gonna tell you exactly what you should be doing the next week and 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 so on and forth so forth and there there are a lot of um wearable devices that track this now um i believe the apple watch can track it but the ones that, that i've used personally are is this item called biostrap biostrap is a heart rate variability measure you can wear you wear it mostly when you sleep and you'll see the variability that you have on a night per night type and then it's going to tell you if you had good variability then you, you're able to push yourself the next day um the other wearable device that, that uh, a couple of golfers i think use because I, I play golf that's kind of my sport um there's this device called whoop if you're familiar w-h-o-o-p um okay. it's made in the u.s it, it kind of tracks the the moment to moment heart rate and allows for rest and recovery to be um detailed in the app uh, but again, I think that w when we started to look at the industry of wearable devices and where science was headed about a year and a half ago, it was one of our conferences, um, what we're seeing is that every person can be allowed to train in their most optimal uh, kind, of, kind of situation because there's a lot of things now that can capture data. And so because we have phones we have watches we have uh all these other wearable devices um the the next thing then would be grabbing all the data in a cloud or in kind of in kind of a format that a a clinician or, or some person would be able to use and then they could really tweak it to become very precise um for for athletes like yourself yeah I've, I've actually heard of that i remember someone else talking about that um another physician talking about that and how they were doing like, I don't know, like, I don't know how many thousands of people because, because, because of the wearable devices that allows them to have more data and the more data they have, they're able to like isolate certain issues and non-issues yeah. and how they can actually dictate like the individual care because they have so much 24 seven data. It's, data. it's all yeah. data. You, know, you start to see patterns when you have. <laughs> <enough data. laughs> 
I, I believe uh, data is more expensive than oil. That, that's where, that was the latest kind of economic stuff that was coming I mean, out. Man, they do it with social media. I mean, look at uh, Facebook bought uh, WhatsApp for $20 billion because not for any other reason other than they just wanted data. They wanted to know who was on WhatsApp so that they can have more information. Um, okay, so, th so then, so we talked about a good portion of nutrition and we talked about the, the HRV. Um, then we, then we come to recovery. So how, how would you then, what are good modalities for someone who is training quite a bit to recover quite a bit, let's say on the athlete side and also the average Joe, because there's other stress factors. Athlete deals with the stress of competition and heavy training. The average Joe deals with one training jujitsu as well as having a wife, a kid, or two kids and a career. Yeah. Um, and then it's like external, like uh, like work life that actually gives their stress. So what what are like some modalities that you think will help like the average jujitsu practitioner that to help that because I feel like there isn't there hasn't been a priority to recovery yet because they don't see that if you recover better, you train better. They just think train that, better, yeah. they, they think that train more is going to make me better. And I'm not saying that training more isn't going to make you better, but you also have to recover just as fast as, as much as you train because the next time that you train, you're going to train harder, better, faster because you gave your body enough recovery in order for you to be able to do that. So I'm assuming the very yeah. primary one that you think is probably nutrition. Yeah. What would be another? Yep, totally. Nutrition is number one, I would say. Uh, meditation, having a, a form of um, breathing technique or exercise you can do regularly. Okay. Um, we used to think that uh, we, we, we take breathing for granted, but it, we've had patients having low oxygen carrying capacity that once they develop a five minute, twice a day, once a day type of breathing, they just listen on, on some free app or something. It starts to allow their brain to shift away from a stressed brain to a more relaxed brain. Um, and that shift allows for more insight to happen. Um, I understand that uh, jujitsu is a very mental sport as much as it, it is physical because you're, you're trying to make quick decisions moment to moment quick decisions and um when we were kind of looking into the idea of insight and the idea of having a good new idea or breakthrough in practice you would need to have your body shift into a non-stressed state for new ideas to come in and so uh if a if a person is um in a setting of, of go 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 uh, got to do tasks one to 20 without any insight break or breathing technique in between. They don't get, um, the brain that isn't allowed to have time to do problems on its own. And so you won't get those, I guess, moment to moment decisions. Um, yeah, I guess you won't delay. train to do very, very good moment. To yeah. yeah um, the other thing delay. that, that we, the other thing is that um, every time you do an exertion exercise that you're working hard, it should the recovery should only be up to 24, uh, 72, 72 hours. If your recovery lasts longer than 72 hours, that means you have a problem with mitigating inflammation or there's a nutritional issue. So, say, say that one more time. So we're talking a 72, the 72 from any type of physical exertion or you're talking about from a, like a like one specific event so so uh you're cutting a little bit but um i heard the question so it was so what i'm trying to say is that um just to clear it up anytime a person does a strenuous exercise or activity the body should be able to recover within 72 hours gotcha if the body recovers further than the 72 hours, so 73 hours, 74, or greater than three days, that means the body isn't able to manage the repair sequences on time. And there's a deeper issue to why that's happening. Okay. <clears throat> um, and typically, uh, jujitsu, the jujitsu practice entails a lot of force from muscular strength. 
But what people don't understand is that we're also using our ligaments and connective tissue. You need it to stretch, elongate, and that has a lot of mitochondria as well. And so if then you have um, lower mitochondrial energy production from nutritional issues or a toxin, then those joints would become less lax and would be prone to tears or the muscles um, would then have less energy capacity during the exercise or more pain over the 72 hours. Does it make sense? I hope I'm making no, sense. No, 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 it totally makes sense. Yeah, it, it kind of couples a little bit with what um, the functional range conditioning, it talks about the, the strength training at the end ranges of the, of the muscle tissues so that you can increase the zacromeres, which then increases the pulling force of the actual muscle on the, on the joint structure. Um, mm -hmm. And that's kind of like I've talked to like a couple of mobility people and we were discussing about how it, the joint strength training brings the actual joint stronger, which in turn makes the actual muscle stronger because it's able to pull harder mm -hmm. on each end, of yeah, the, on, on each tendon. From the anchors. Yeah, yeah from that's the true. actual anchors. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so for me, the, the, the things that I would actually like to share um, is to give enough time for rest. Uh, have your rest days and stuff not to have rest days so, so that so um, wait, wait, wait so that, that that's the that's the key question because there's there's two the the factor that i have is 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 how much rest is enough rest like how does like a mm -hmm. like how does an athlete because he, he, here's where i run into like where the, there's the even even the average jujitsu person is going to go two to four times a week let's say there there's someone they're a weekend warrior jujitsu player they're still going to go two to four times a week unless they just stop going. Then you have like the athlete guy that's doing six to seven days a week. Mm -hmm. It's like, how, how does that guy figure out when, when to rest? When yeah, to that's rest. True. At what point does <laughs> yeah. he know other than to rest, other than to, to just listen to his body? But then it goes to that psychological fact, factor of like, do I take a day off? Because usually the higher level athletes are younger. So they 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 have a little bit of an ego, a little bit more testosterone <laughs> in them, where they're like, you know, like the pain is good. I need to I need you to just man up and just and keep training. But yeah. like, is that like will over over smarts? Like you know what I mean? Like I, I like how does that person in, like learn how to listen to their body so that they know? Well, yeah, it's a good day to rest. If it's not a good day to rest, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's tough to answer that question without data, I think. That's my perspective. Um, and so there are ways to, to understand if your body needs to rest from a molecular standpoint or okay. from a data tracking standpoint. Um, a couple of lab tests that uh, we actually run for, for a couple of the athletes that, that, that come in are standard blood work, looking for inflammation, um, complete blood counts, you're looking for resolution of bruises within, again, those 72-hour window. Uh, you're looking for also, if, if they do have those wearable devices, you're, you're looking for the quality of sleep that they're getting. And if the heart rate variability during sleep is lower on average, then they need to rest the next day. Um, so we're looking at laboratory markers. You can look into markers for inflammation. Um, they were in the articles that I had sent you. I'm not going to go into the, kind of the details of, of what those are, but there are markers. Um, you're looking into resolution of inflammation or pain, resolution of bruises within 72 hours. You're looking into the, the kind of the sleep patterns and variability of heart rate during sleep. If the variability starts to decrease, the body's too fatigued to go into the deep sleep. The body isn't too fatigued to go into recovery sleep. So you'd need to spend more time um, resting the next day. Uh, other than that, it, it's it's actually a tough question to to answer. What you just asked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, well, um, but, but you did a good job. Yeah, a lot of people. From, from from what I got from you is basically, obviously, your number one key is is going to be nutrition. Um, then you got to listen. There are to markers your body. for that. Yeah. yeah, nutrition is number one. Then you got to listen to your body. You got to get adequate sleep. You got to watch your heart rate variability or, or at least track it so that you know that if it's on the low side, you have to then, uh, while you sleep, then you out. have yeah. to take the yeah. next thing yeah. off. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then you were, then periodically, if you want to be 100% scientific about it, 
periodically go and get your blood markers done. Get so some blood work, yeah. That's, get some blood work done it. to kind of check your inflammation and make sure that your body's actually able to reduce process it. Yeah, yeah, process the inflammation that you're actually kind of getting. That's that's right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> You can get a PhD in this stuff, man. How long have you been doing this this uh, work? Uh, I've been doing I've been doing fitness for a while, man. Wow. Never, never. Uh, uh, I was briefly thinking about getting into the medical field. I just don't I don't do well with uh, like, books. Like, <laughs> no, I don't I don't do well with like like sick people. Like oh, I can God. I can deal with like healthy people that are trying to be healthier, or like. But but I, I tried it. I, I kind of like I actually did something where I went and saw a friend of mine that was an exercise physiologist. I used to teach for a personal training certification. Oh, she used hey. to come in and uh, and she would teach the the heart rate stuff. Mm -hmm. And she invited me to her hospital one time, and I went over there, and you know I kind of like followed her around and everything. I was like, yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> It's tough, man. Yeah, hospital work is just tough. That's why I, I left. I'm, I'm running my own clinic now. I just don't go back to the hospital. Or anything. So, so, so one, last, one last question, because I'm, I'm not 20. And so sure, I sure. want to kind of ask for anybody that might be watching that is a little bit older, is the effects of aging. Aging's obviously- Oh, yeah, that, that's yeah, a good question. The effects question. of aging and training, um, that's one thing that I've noticed that I absolutely hate is that because I've been so active all my life that I, I'm starting to feel like it's just my body, like I have to be a little bit more on point with my diet. Like I can't really take days off because if I take days off, I get very lazy. Um, I atrophy quite quickly, uh, mm -hmm. meaning that if I don't do some type of actual uh, weight bearing exercise, I, my muscle tissue gets, I wouldn't say deflated, but it gets, it gets softer. Um, mm -hmm. And I and I know it's correlated to aging. When I get sore now, the the, the delayed onset muscle soreness lingers a little longer. It, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. it, where before I used to work out and it would take you know 24 to like 48 hours. Now it's like 48 to 72 hours. Just yeah. to, you know, <laughs> You're hitting the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean that's kind of like that's kind of the range. <laughs> Um, I've also just with time as well, I've learned how to listen to my body. So some of the stuff that you're talking about scientifically, I kind of do on my own. Like yeah, I, can tell yeah, into if I have a hard day of training <laughs> when I go to sleep, like I can tell the next morning, like, wow, I really did not sleep well and yeah. I know to not, yeah. to not train as hard the next day. But that's just, you know, with time that you kind of learn your own body. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> what, what are things could people like people like me that go, OK, well, like I want to try to continue as close as I can to what I used to train when I was 20. But obviously, I'm no longer 20 mm -hmm. to be able to kind of mitigate some of those issues. Yeah. So so the work on aging was actually um, well, the work that I follow on aging is by this doctor in Australia. His name is Michael Fennec, so really a brilliant guy. He, he worked for, um, I believe it was the World Health or the UN. And his, his main line of work before was he was a radiation biologist. <laughs> Crazy stuff. So he was working on the impact of radiation on, on cellular function and what happens to the cell. Uh, he did that for about 20 years, I think, or 30 years. And then shifted into um, just the cell and how that, how damage to the cell would then change, would change function. Um, the reason why he, he went through that track is because after about X years of working with radiation on the cell, he came to the conclusion that radiation induces cell damage, right? So it induces DNA damage. But when he looked into all the other factors that could induce DNA damage, he said, well, anything can induce DNA damage. Nutrition can induce DNA damage. Um, exertion can induce DNA damage, heat, radiation. And so he started to look into all the factors to reduce DNA damage. And so what he then uh, found out was that aging in general is DNA damage dependent. All right, so I'm going to repeat that aging is DNA damage dependent. In that concept, if you then are able to reduce DNA damage or you're able to to improve DNA repair on a timely basis, you will slow or even stop the process of aging moving forward. 
So, so then we take your, your, we take your story as an example. You've been through a, a pretty active lifestyle, uh, pretty rigorous. You, you competed a lot. You had a lot of damage from exercise stress, maybe, or the, the turnover of muscle repair and, and kind of repair and recover damage and re- repair, recovery, damage, repair, recovery. So as you age, one of the key things that you you'd like to look out for are nutrients for repair, which are vitamin B2. Um, there are ways to test vitamin B2. Um, look into the process called methylation, which are, which are the vitamins of B9, B12, uh, and B6. <clears throat> and then to, to always have a minimum of 2.5 um, grams of BCAA in your diet every time you work out, minimum 2.5 grams. Apart from that, you're doing all the good stuff. So you're doing the healthy eating, the, the non-processed food lifestyle. But if you're able to optimize those sets of nutrients together with the antioxidants that produce glutathione, you're going to dramatically improve DNA repair and reduce the damage that's being done to them on a daily basis. Um, then also the idea that uh, as you age, you clear toxins when you sleep. And so that would be an integral part of your recovery phase. Sleep. And you sleep a lot. You get a lot. Of, <laughs> you have a lot of time for sleep or? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, now, now because it's like work is a little bit off right now because of this whole mm-hmm. COVID thing. But um, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, like I had to, yeah, I had to kind of adjust how I, like even my training, I, I had to stop training the, the, in New York where I know Cato, they have like the advanced jujitsu class, like at eight o'clock at night or seven thirty at night. And I had to stop that class because it was so intense that by the time I got home at like nine o'clock, 9 PM, nine thirty, ten 10 o'clock, midnight, one o'clock in the morning, I'm still kind of like, still kind of amped uh, from the actual workout. And then yeah. I have to wake up and work at six o'clock in the morning. So I had to kind of cut that class because it was just, it was just too much. Like yeah. my body was just too hyped up to go to sleep and then it was affecting my sleep. So I 100% understand that. But I'm, I'm seeing like a common theme when it comes to, uh, to the nutrition. It's like iron because of, uh, for oxygen, B vitamins, yep. magnesium, zinc, fish oil. But even the ones that you said right now, the B2, B9, obviously it's still, it's still B under vitamins. B vitamins. Yeah. And then just yeah. adding BCAA. One last question before we kind of head out, like a, a couple of things more about uh, uh, nutrition. Mm-hmm. Is it, what's your, what's your opinion on dairy mm-hmm. and, uh, and beef? Okay. <clears throat> so um, dairy would depend on where you, you're coming from in the world uh, because certain populations can't process dairy. Um, Asians, for example, 99% of Asians just can't digest dairy. Some really? of the European descent individuals can process dairy, so they don't have as much a response. Um, so that's the first kind of answer to that question. But there are layers to the answer to the questions because it depends on where the dairy is produced as well. If the dairy is produced in highly processed cow factories, um, there's a lot more hormones and a lot more antibiotics that come into the milk. And so that would then lead to the issues that, that we've had. Um, happen. Uh, mostly dairy issues would be, would be GI, gastrointestinal. Um, but on the plus side, uh, dairy is, very, very, is a very good medium to grow probiotics of lactobacilli category. And so if, if you're cutting all dairy, uh, better make sure you're, you're getting some other stuff to put the lactobacilli um, bacteria in your guts. I was so waiting for that. Case to case. Yeah, that's exactly case that. Case. Probiotics. Yeah, that was a. Uh, I was just kind of. That's kind of where I was leaning because I know that, like to me, like it doesn't make for me, just logically, like why would why would a human being be drinking baby milk from a cow? Yeah. If you <laughs> really think it. about it, that's basically what it is. It's basically yeah. <laughs> it's breast milk from for for a baby cow that is you're not a cow and you you're not a baby. So yeah. like for me, logically, it doesn't really make sense, even though I like dairy quite a bit, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a heavy cheesy eater, but I understand why there's like that stigma of like why dairy is kind of bad for you or why dairy is not the best thing for you. 
Um, but there, the biggest thing symptoms. is the probiotics. Also, there are symptoms. If, if you can't take the dairy, you do get symptoms. You're going to get gas, bloating. You're going to get some digestive issues, right. some skin issues or asthma. Um, then, going into your probiotic, yeah, go ahead, please. No, 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 go ahead. No, the um, probiotics, I just was like, that, that's the important one is the probiotics, which is basically what uh, it promotes good gut health, which goes yeah. back to what we started at, which so, is... So with the probiotics, I think to give a kind of a brief explanation of how these things work, um, the scientific community has come to the understanding that probiotics are tourists. So you take the probiotic, it stays in your gut for two weeks, and then they go out. Uh, and so just like tourists, they come into the, the country for two weeks. They have a good impact on the economy, right? It, it, it improves the economy and all that. And then they leave and then, all right, they're, they're, they're gone. Um, and so we, we now kind of try to maneuver patients' guts by giving the probiotics during the time that they need them when the diet isn't set and then giving prebiotics um, with probiotics to hopefully allow the probiotics to seed into the gut. And then they start eating the prebiotic fiber and they start to colonize within the area. It, our hopes that it would colonize. Um, in the work that was done in UCSD, uh, it was the lab of um, Rob Knight. What they found out was that it, with a minimum of two weeks, you're gonna see microbial change with a minimum of two weeks food change removing the processed stuff, removing, putting a lot of fiber from vegetables. But the changes will only be permanent if you maintain the change for six to 12 months. Interesting. Oh no. I think. Yeah, you froze a little bit right there. Give it a second. Iro. There we oh, go. there you go. There we go. Yeah, we got cut. Where, where did I, where did you, I, I where heard did you six to 12 months. Yeah, <clears throat> that's what the research from UCSD is uh, currently saying, that it takes that long for the, the microbes to start to shift in diversity permanently. And so the diet change would need to be that long on a minimum. Um, and so what are probiotics really for? If you look down into the research for each strain, the probiotic strains have different impacts on different inflammation signaling. And basically that's what they do. They, they're there, eat the food you're eating to produce better anti-inflammatory signals to the body. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> that was, yeah, I didn't know that one. That, um, one, that one. that one was, that's the first time I, I didn't know that one. That one I didn't know. Wow, interesting. <laughs> Okay, so then, so then we go back to the the major one. This is basically yeah. just this is for like general fitness a little bit, not necessarily for jujitsu people. Is like what's your what's your mm -hmm. big picture thing with the food industry? I personally think it's getting better, but it's still oh yeah, it, it's, it really it's is getting better. But mm -hmm. like here in the, I mean, I'm not sure what it's like over there, but in the, uh, here in the United States, it's the processed food is getting less and less it's getting a little bit more and more towards like the, the natural food and all the, all the, all the books that I've read and things that I've seen different opinions on nutrition and things like that. They do this and they take studies here and they do all kinds of stuff. And everybody kind of arguing like, no, the vegan is the best way. And, yeah. diet, <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, the carnivore diet is now somewhat popular a little bit sometimes. So like everyone has like their own, like, like general opinion obviously they all base it on somewhat of science and they kind of pick and choose which study that they're going to use. But I just think that the, for me, it's like the closer you get to nature, the better it is. I don't know if you froze one more time. Hello. There we go. Oh, there you are. Sorry about that. I think we got cut. Sorry yeah. about that. I think, so, yeah. so I left off where I left off basically saying, you know, that everyone kind of picks and chooses their, their, mm -hmm. options. it's like a religion. People are trying to 100%, like, <laughs> go into the, but what I get, because I, I kind of, because I, I'm kind of 
like nutrition is not my thing. I, I know that it's an important factor. So I, I take all the information with a grain of salt. And so the way I look at all these different books and studies and stuff like that is that the closer you get to nature, that's the way to go. Yep, basically, that's true. <laughs> that's basically the way it is. So it's like, there's nothing wrong with meat. Just where yep. does the meat come from? Like, how do they yep. meat? Uh, stay away from processed stuff? Anything that comes in a box, don't don't eat it. You shouldn't you shouldn't be eating it. The majority of not everything, but the majority of it. Um, so it's like when people try to like well, you know well, which is the best diet, I tell them you know th there is no best diet. There is mm -hmm. the diet that works for you. Like what what yeah. what are you going to be able to stick to? And then there's like major no nos that you're not supposed to do. Like don't eat don't eat candy. You know don't don't eat a bag <laughs> of chips every day. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the things that like, I kind of like people don't seem to understand. And so like the food industry, like is getting better, but it's not there. And like one of the books that I just finished reading, which is kind of great so far is it talks about how the food industry didn't, its goal wasn't to poison people. It was just trying to produce make more food, make, yeah, to make more food at a lower cost. And then the side yep, effect, yep, yep. Been, like the, what, what we have now. Yeah. So, so I, I completely agree with everything you just said. Um, I have the, uh, I guess, the luxury of running tests on my patients. <laughs> so I get, I get patients eating crappy food. They, we ask them to change their food. We do our lab testing before and after, and we see the change. But what I'd like to share from my experience is that even though we put someone on the perfect diet, no processed food, no nothing, there are still nutritional issues that come up, one or two of them. That, that you need to test for to pick up. That they won't be feeling any symptoms, but then they, when you check it, oh, they're, they're bordering on vitamin D deficiency. They're bordering on some form of B vitamin issue. Um, and the reason why, why the body, I think, is in so, so much flux is because the food that we have isn't produced with the same nutrient-rich soil or the same nutrient-rich farms or fields anymore. Mm -hmm. um, Apart from the fact that on a daily basis, um, the, one, of my, one of my teachers, mentors, Dr. Michael Stone, taught me before that the, pollution to, the solution to pollution is dilution. And so whenever the body gets a toxin, maybe from the air that we breathe or something that we eat, um, your body will try to dilute it using different things. It'll try to clear it out with nutritional um, inputs. And so... If you then have a limited source of nutrients from, from the things coming in and you're still exposed to some toxins, there will still be one or two imbalances that will come out. Might not be great enough to create a symptom right now, but if you progress throughout the next 10 years, you'll pick it up eventually. Eventually. Yeah. Uh, and so for me, that, that's my kind of take on it. It's not, so eat, be a whole foods kind of, um, as much as possible, but at the same time, um, understanding key markers that you can routinely check on would be where uh, the science is headed, as well as the the the, the from nutrigenomic studies, understanding your own genome and how your body starts to process the 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 data or the nutrients from food on a genetic capacity. We're getting cut. Yeah, we keep getting. I think the, yeah, the yeah. video starts. Again. I think uh, I think that's the universe saying that we gotta we gotta start getting close to wrapping this up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This was uh this yeah. was by far one of the greatest conversations I've had in a long time. I really hey, thank you. <laughs> really enjoyed this. <laughs> Me too. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully what what I'm probably gonna do maybe if you're up to it, I would love to be able to read a lot of these uh, articles that you sent me, and maybe we set up another yeah. down the road to sure. discuss a different yeah, article. No problem. Because, uh, because yeah. this is this is specifically the articles that you sent me were specifically for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. For Jiu Jitsu, yeah, that's what I that's why I pulled them out for you. <laughs> yeah, so I would love to be able to kind of dissect it and be able to like come up with questions that I can ask you to kind of clarify for me. Sure. Yeah, to yeah. Clarify for the community. Um, for sure. Escolona, Dr. Escolona, I really appreciate this. I'll say thank you, Iro. You, yeah. It was a pleasure chatting with you and we'll be talking soon, but
Yeah, I know it's late there, and thank you for for taking the time at this time. But um, let's. I appreciate let's talk soon. You, you taking the time out of your day. Thank you so much for me. Okay, you. have a good one, and Bye-bye. take care there. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.